have a seat. Good morning. Man, that wind was howling last night, wasn't it? I thought the house was going to blow down yesterday. It was, uh, it was a really, uh, kept waking up, man. Okay, Pastor Zeke is out today. He's enjoying uh, some time off, and uh, we really like it when he takes that time off because uh, it gives him a chance to rest and, and to recharge. And uh, not that he like needs it per se, but he, like, like everybody needs to rest at some point. And so we're glad that he uh, rests a little bit. Uh, and so when he's gone, uh, it, sorry, this, can we pull it down just a hair? Because I'm going to get a little louder and, uh, and it just sounds just a little too hot right now uh, as we're just early in introduction. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Anyways, way back in uh, 2016 it was, Pastor Gary and I started uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, and so when Pastor Zeke's out, we always just know where the next guy uh, picks up, and so Pastor Jacob, I think, taught the last time. So it's been quite a few years. We started in 1 Corinthians, now we're all the way to uh, Ephesians. We, we began that uh, this year. It's probably pretty good that Pastor Zeke took a little time off, because he's already in Galatians, so he's like hot on our tail now, and so we've got we've to make a little uh, distance up uh, right now, so... Uh, anyway, we started Ephesians um, beginning of this year. You can catch up on the website if you want to. Uh, but for the sake of just jumping in today, I want to give a little introduction. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 today. We're going to go, uh, the goal is to go verse 7 to verse 16. Uh, so Ephesians 4, 7 to 16 is where we'll be today. Um, but the book of Ephesians is one of the richer books in the New Testament. We'll try to keep the introduction short, but Paul writes this letter uh, to the church at Ephesus. It's a book that is both very practical, but also very doctrinal. Uh, it's very similar to much of Paul's writings, where it's doctrine and teaching first, and, and about this is who God is, and then it comes to what our response is or the practical living after that, right? You get these, these biblical, these doctrinal indicatives, and then you get these practical imperatives right after that. And it's split in two parts. This book uh, is split half and half, right? Uh, chapters 1 through 3, and then chapters 4 through 6. Four, uh, uh, in chapters 1 through 3, we see a ton about who God is. Uh, and then who we are in Christ. And so you'll see that phrase in, in chapters 1 through 3, in Christ or in Him so many times. And so I'd encourage you to go back and read chapters 1 through 3. The second half of the book, chapters 4 through 6, is the response where Paul begins to tell the church and Christians how we are to respond to God. And, and that's the order that it has to go, uh, that we would know first and then take action Second, and we don't ever want to lose sight of that fact in the Christian life that this Christian life is a response to who God is. And I think Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, explains it uh, perfectly. He says uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That it's only reasonable, it's only rational, that after all that God has done for us, that we would then respond to Him. Okay? And so uh, we can never forget we could never forget that it is just a response. So two weeks ago, uh, Pastor Jacob started chapter four. He looked at verses one through six. Uh, Paul beseeched or he begged the believer to walk worthy of the calling with which we've been called. He talks about uh, walking in humility and gentleness and patience and to walk in unity. And that would really be uh, kind of the main point of chapter four is this unity that the church would have one with another, uh, you know, within itself, this unity unity, and, and we'll talk about it, it's going to behave like a body soon, and the body has to be united when it does anything. Um, and, and at the end, what Pastor Jacob covered at the end what was these ones that he mentioned, that it's one body and one spirit, and there's one hope of our calling, and one Lord, and one faith, and one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And that's how Pastor Jacob finished. The last thing I'll say in introduction before we pray and get into this. 
is that we always have to remember, and I know I've said it three times already, but we always have to remember that chapters one through three come before chapters four through six. And that sounds silly to say that because obviously numerically they do. But so often in the Christian life, we can forget this in practice and we can start doing and doing and doing in almost in a way that we're trying to earn something from God. And it doesn't work that way. We, we can't earn everything, anything from God. Everything we have from God is a gift from Him. If we do these things, if we end up just doing for God and not first enjoying who He is and what He's done, then we will become very tired very fast. And I don't know if anyone's ever lived that life of trying to live in a way where you're trying to earn God's love, but we can't. We can't live that way. Uh, I remember hearing a dad speak to his child, and he said, son, there's nothing you can do in the whole wide world that would make me love you any less. And I think we go, yeah, we understand that, right? He goes, but there's also nothing you can do that would make me love you any more. You already have all my love. And I think that's so necessary as Christians that we understand there's nothing we can do to earn any more of God's love or lose any of God's love. But sometimes we can start living our lives that way, can't we? Going, well, God, I'm going to do this so that you'll be happy, I'm gonna do, I'm, and I'm not going to do that because I know that doesn't make you happy. Now, that should be a natural response, but it cannot be that we try to earn our own salvation. <laughs> of course, we know that once we're saved, though, we have a different nature. We have a different desire. Our hearts have changed from the things they used to be. We want to do the things that please God, but it has to always remain in that way, that it's a response to God. And so as we continue on in chapter four, remember this, that we're not doing this to earn God's love. We're doing it because we've already been given God's love. Yes? Okay. Let's pray and we'll get started. Lord, we thank you so much that as we get ready to approach your word, Lord, we pray that there'd be a great sobriety. We pray that we would take serious the things that you've said. We want to hear you this morning, God. We ask that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you'd give us insight and understanding into your word. Lord, we don't want to just read stories. Lord, we have the truth in our laps right now and we want to hear from you. And so God, would you please speak to us? Uh, If we need uh, correction, Lord, would you correct us today? If we need encouragement, would you encourage us today? Lord, build us up in our faith. You tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we want to know you better this morning. So go before our time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go verses uh, 7 to 16 today, but I would like to just read the first part of the chapter so we could read it all uh, in, in one. So starting in chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Verse 7, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Uh, He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill All things. Verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ." from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth 
of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So back to verse 7 where we'll start today. He starts by saying, uh, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. I, I love that, that he starts. When we were saved, guys, we were each given a gift. Now, what I like about this is he doesn't say, um, now to some of you guys, some of you might have gotten a gift somewhere, you know, look under your seat. If you have the ticket, you're the one type thing. It's not that. It's not a lottery. It's not a raffle. It's, it's, it's very personal and it's each one that those who come into the family of Christ have been given a gift. We've each been given one. Now, some of us, uh, don't, maybe we don't know what that gift is. We don't know how that gift was given. We don't, but what he's going to begin to talk about, and, and some of your headings might say in your Bible, if you have like kind of those breaks in your Bible, uh, that, it's, that it's talking about spiritual gifts right now. That he's going to talk about the gifts that are given, uh, a gift of the filling of the Holy Spirit and a gift uh, uh, of something that is to be used within the body of Christ. And I want to say, too, what a huge privilege that is to be given a gift by God. Like beyond salvation, I mean, it was already enough. If God had just said, hey, I'm forgiving you of your sins, you got to live in this miserable world for the rest of your life and just grit your teeth and get through it, we could say, yeah, it's plenty of gift. Because when we consider how long our lives would be, I mean, even if we live to be 100 years old, that's still really short in the light of eternity. So we can live a miserable 100 years on this earth, and that's still okay, right? Why? Because, because we have eternity waiting, and we'll be with Jesus forever, and things will be good then. And he, but there's more, right? It's, it's like the infomercial, right? There's, but, but wait, but wait, there's more. So if we said all we have is our sins forgiven, we get to go to heaven. That's great, and that's good enough, and God doesn't owe us any more. But he says, no, but I've given you something else. I've given you a gift. According, he says, to the, uh, 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 to the, the measure of Christ's gift. That's how big the gift is, right? that each one of us can be gifted from that gift. What's that gift? It's going to be the giving of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that come with that so that we might even be edified on this earth. Isn't that nice to know? That, that we're, <laughs> we could just be stuck on this terrible earth for a really long time, but he goes, no, I've given gifts for the edifying of itself, and we'll even get to that part as we get to the end, but to be supernaturally gifted by God. What a gift. And so we should worship Him, we should enjoy that, and the gifts, there's two parts to these gifts. The gifts, number one, we have to realize are, are, are chosen and distributed by God. We don't choose the gifts we want, we'll get into that a little later. We don't get to pick, it's not a buffet style of like, man, I'd really like that you know, you know for, for people who are like not musical, I'm like, I wish I had those kind of gifts, right? And those would be the ones I'd pick. The, um, like, sweeping up the trash after events, that's not usually the gift that everyone's like, ooh, that's the one I really want, you know? <laughs> but guess who gives them? God gives them. And He gives them to each one as He desires. And we'll get into that as we, as we get towards the end. So, so number one, distributed by God as He wills. Number two, they're to be used to edify the body of Christ, and they are meant for God's glory, not our own. That's very important, too. Now, to some, you know, I'm realizing right now something got cut off in my notes because this is the second time I've turned a page and, and I'm like, nope, there was something else there. So we're going to see how this goes because I'm not going to go back and get my computer right now. <laughs> this is the problem. I started typing my notes. I was talking to Gary about this. I used to just scratch my notes out on stuff and now I'm stuck with a computer and this is, <laughs> this is bad news. Okay. You remember when Jesus tells this parable and he's talking about those who were given talents or, or, or another, uh, I think it's in Luke, it's, it's, it's the minas, right? He gives a certain amount of money to these guys. To one, he gives uh, one and to another two and to another five. And he says, you know, kind of do something with this. 
And he gives them that gift. And so one of them, the one who had five makes five more. And the one who had two makes two more. And the one who had one buries it in the sand and doesn't do anything with it. And, and when the master comes back, he goes, man, you know, what good servants you guys are. That, that you who had five, you made five more. And you who had two made two more. And, and then he looks at the other one. He goes, why would you just put that in the sand? Loose translation, by the way. The notes are bad. Uh, but, but he says, why, why would you do it that way? Why would you not at least put it in the bank and it could get interest, but you did nothing with what I gave you? We can look now and realize that, that what he, he didn't judge them one against another. He didn't say, hey, you with the two, you should have made five, like that guy made five. No, that guy was given something greater and he made something with it, but he didn't compare them to each other. He compared them to what he gave them. I gave you this. This is what you should do. This is really good within the body of Christ that we don't just look at each other and go, well, that guy's got all those gifts and I've only got this one gift and what am I supposed to do? I've only got the one. It doesn't matter that you only have the one. It doesn't matter that I only have. Most of us are not those five uh, talent people. Most of us are not those five minor people. Most of us are those one or two and God goes, just make another one or two right? Just use what you've been given and, and use it for God's glory. And as God sees that we're faithful, sometimes he gives us more. And so that's what he's talking about here. There was a rebuke from God uh, to, toward the last one who had done nothing with the gift that was given. And so as we look here in Ephesians, he says, each one has been, uh, was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so we're going to get into that. Now, talking about the gift giver himself in verses 8, 9, and 10, it could be a little confusing. He says, therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended in the lower parts of the earth? He who ascended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. It's speaking of Jesus here, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, that he's the one who gives uh, the gifts to men, the three days and, and nights in the earth, that time between his death and resurrection, we believe to be that time that he preached to those who were waiting for the Messiah there in Abraham's bosom, uh, who he would uh, then lead to heaven. Uh, it's, it's a loose kind of, uh, Paul seems to be loosely quoting from Psalm 68 here, uh, mainly verse 18. There are some different schools of thought as to why Paul doesn't quote it directly. Um, but this, this giving, it seems, uh, as described prophetically in Psalm 68, when Jesus ascended into heaven, this was evidenced by his triumph over every foe when he says leading captivity captive. Uh, I like what this common tainer says. It says, with the variations or the different schools of thought here, it's better to think that Paul was not quoting one particular verse of Psalms, but rather he was summarizing all of Psalm 68, which has many words similar to those in Psalm 68, 18. The essence of the psalm is the military victor, uh, that the military victor has the right to give gifts to those who are identified with him. Christ, having been that victor, right, captivated sinful people by redeeming them, uh, he is victor, and he gives gifts to the church. Whereas Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 speak of the gifts given to believers, and we'll talk on those, Ephesians chapter 4 speaks more to the gifted believers who are given to the church. That God has a group of people that he gives as a blessing to the church. Uh, Jesus also said that it was to our advantage that he go away. If you remember in John chapter 16, he says, If I do not depart, the helper will not come. And so we receive the helper, the Holy Spirit. So here's what he says in verse 11. He's going to uh, talk about some of these gifts right now, about what he gives to his church. It says in verse 11, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the, of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He says that he himself gave some. Now, here's a list. Now, these are more of these uh, kind of office kind of gifts. This isn't an exhaustive list of spiritual gifts, but seeming to be what he gives to the church. But it has to do with helping for the equipping of the saints. When he says he himself, we see that Jesus is the one who is establishing 
the office is. They are the work and the appointment of him, not of man. That it's not just someone goes, hey, I'd like to be an apostle today. You know, it's not like, a, what do they call it? Like when you bid jobs, you know? It's like, it's like, hey, I'd like to become captain this, you know, this year or whatever. Or I'd like to go do this thing. Uh, it's, it's an appointment made by God. Now, now some of these things, we don't, we don't use, uh, these first two, we kind of don't use those words a lot anymore. Uh, some churches do. Um, some of it to me is a little suspect sometimes, uh, but we won't get into all of that. But, uh, but he starts with apostles, and those are those who are sent, who are special ambassadors for God's work, though not in the same authoritative sense as those first century apostles that we saw. Those first century apostles were used to provide the foundation, right, of what we see in the early, in the New Testament, um, and so these apostles, though, were those leaders. They're ones who are, who are sent. Uh, prophets, those are those who speak forth God's word uh, in complete consistency with the foundation of the Old and New Testament. So, so we don't get, like, new revelation. We don't have someone just shows up like, oh, hey, I'm Prophet Daniel, and I'm going to speak to you on behalf of God. And then I start speaking, and you go, wait a second, that doesn't quite line up with what I see in the Bible. And it's like, no, 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 don't worry about it. I'm a prophet, so I can say whatever I want. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Uh, any prophecy uh, has to come in line. And, and really, it's not necessarily always just foretelling the future. Right? That's not prophecy. Now, there's a, there's a degree of that with prophecy, right? As we look at what will happen uh, in the future, we see it all through the Old Testament. We see some of it in the New Testament of what will happen uh, uh, later on. But really, prophecy is speaking forth on behalf of God. It's speaking from God to people. And so sometimes, like we said, it's predictive, but not necessarily so. Um, but it's always subject uh, to the discernment and judgment uh, of, of the Word of God and of those who God has given those gifts. And so uh, kind of same as like we said with the apostles uh, and modern prophets, uh, they do not speak, again, with that same authority as the first cent century church uh, did. Some of those who, who we would call prophets back then, uh, you know, helped to write the, the canonized scripture. We're not adding to that. The end of the book tells us that, doesn't it? Right? Don't add to it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it, but also don't add to it. Okay, um, evangelists, the, this next one, are, are those who are specifically gifted to preach the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. There are some that are, that are just certainly within the church uh, seen as that, that those who go out and they preach. They just go out and preach the gospel and, and, and they've been gifted to do that. Uh, they, they just kind of everything they do leads to that and they speak about salvation in Christ. And then the, the, the last one listed here, pastors and teachers. Now, some uh, kind of disagree on how this works. I'm not a Greek scholar, but those who do study the Greek talk about the, the way the word placement is and the way the, the, um, uh, the articles right before uh, that it's not talking of two separate things. It could it could really almost be a slash pastor teacher, uh, right? That he's not just saying there's some that are pastors and those who are teachers. And and we know about like the shepherding work that a pastor does. There there's there's both, right? The word pastor means shepherd, so it's like like to tend the flock. But part of tending the flock is teaching the flock, right? And we'll get into exactly uh, what that means. Um, but teaching is an essential part of the pastoral ministry, and so it's appropriate that these go together. So these are some of those kind of offices, but, but what's the purpose of them? We, we really have to, th 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 this verse, chat, verse 12, um, is one of the most favorite verses for me in, in the New Testament because we're going, what is the church to be about? Now, there's a great many things that the church can be about, but there's one thing that it must be about, and this is it. That the reason God would give apostles and prophets and, and evangelists and pastor teachers, the reason he would give that to the church is because the primary function of the church is to be a place of teaching. It's to be a place of instruction. Now, can it also be a place who, who runs different kinds of ministries? Sure, it, it can. It can. Uh, is it supposed to be a place that feeds the poor? It can feed the poor, but that's not the primary job of the church. 
Is it a a place that should have uh, X ministry or Y ministry or whatever ministry? Yes, it could have those, but that's not the primary role of the church. Well, to save people, that's got to be the primary role of the church. Not necessarily. Now, should the church preach the gospel? Absolutely, it should preach the gospel. And people should get saved uh, from their sins, right? They should come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But that's not the primary role. Also, I think the main problem that we've seen in the last 20, 30 years uh, within the church of the West, America specifically, is that the church has become more of an entertainment center. And that's not what it's supposed to be either. It's not supposed to be a place where people are just on the edge of their seats waiting for a thing. It's not like going to the movies. Sorry. We're just, we're just not that exciting. And for, but for good reason. What's that old saying? Whatever you catch them with, you got to keep them with. There's reasons that churches are beginning to do some really outlandish things just to keep a crowd. And then once you get a big enough crowd, well, you don't want them to leave. So you got to keep them entertained. You also have to be careful what you say, because if you offend them, they might not come back. Here's the thing. The job of the church, right? The reason he would give apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers, he says, is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's what the church is to be about for the equipping of the saints. What what does it mean to be equipped? To be trained up, right? To learn. The goal, and and one of my favorite books in the New Testament is, is 1 Timothy, a book on church order as he's telling a young pastor how to pastor a church. What does he tell him? I I think it's like seven different times he talks about doctrine, teaching. That, That the primary purpose of the church is to teach. To teach what? To teach folks how to be Christians, right? Most of what we teach here is not new stuff. We don't come up with new stuff every week. We go like Paul says that I may stir you up by way of reminder. We remind the the flock what we're supposed to be doing. And we remind ourselves who God is and what God's about and what we are to do in what? In response to Him. But that's what we're doing. We're equipping the church. So the purpose of the church is not all these other things. The church teaches us how to be Christians, and then we go out and we behave like Christians in the world around us. And that's why, kind of within the Calvary Chapel movement, there's kind of always been this saying where like, and I think Pastor Chuck used to say it like all the time, where he was like, healthy sheep will beget healthy sheep. Like we don't even make it a point to go, let's grow the church. Like let's, what new thing can we do to make the people come or whatever? The goal is that if we teach the Bible, and not just the greatest hits of the Bible, but the Bible, the whole Bible, that if we just put the Word of God into the hearts of God's people, then God will do a work in the heart of each person, and then those people would go out and be Christians. I remember, I don't think she'll ever listen to this, but I would say this to her face. I did say it to her face. I remember telling my little sister once, I said, hey, look, um, about loving your neighbor, the church is not here to love your neighbor. You don't just pay your tithes and offerings and the pastor goes and loves your neighbor. You're a Christian too. You go love your neighbor. It was a good little discussion we had. But I'd say that to everybody else here today too. Right? Because the thing is, when we walk out those doors today, we all go in different directions. We all come in contact with different people. We, you go one place, you go another place, you go somewhere else, you go be with family, you go be with friends, you go be with the person at State or whatever. You will all go different places. So what should we, we're, we're little ambassadors for Christ when we leave, right? We're little missionaries when we leave. Why? Because we go to different places. So the goal is that the church would teach doctrine, would teach us who God is. And he'll say why in just a second, but here's what is, what's going to happen. He says it's for the equipping of the saints. Wait a second, wait a second. Uh, now, if you're, if you're somewhat newer, you might think saints, wait, saints, like those old dead people? No. The Bible's clear with us that those who have named the name of Christ, we are saints. We are saints. So the job of the church is to equip the saints. Those who have named the name of Christ, you're saints. And so our job is to equip the saints. For what? 
for the work of ministry. No, 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 pastor. I don't want to be in no ministry. I don't want to be. This isn't like a capital M, like becoming a minister type thing. The word ministry means service, right? It's so it's teaching us how to get to work in serving the Lord. And again, that could happen here in the local church. There's plenty of opportunity always to serve the Lord here in the church, right? We got people today. There's a, there's a bunch of people serving right now. It's not just me standing right here, right? We got guys out in the foyer watching the doors, watching the parking lot. We got people in the sound booth right there who I've said this in jokingly in the past, but it's actually pretty serious. They've got the most power in the room right now, right? They can turn this mic off just as, as much as they'd like to, right? They just <laughs> shut it right off. So, so there's multiple people, but there's also people in the back, right? There's people in the back that are tending to the kids. And not just tending to them like, hey, let's just watch you until church is over and get you back here with the parents. No. Do you know that what they're doing back there is this very same thing? The reason we use really such a robust children's ministry curriculum is because we believe young kids can know Jesus too. We believe young kids can be saved, and we believe they could be little evangelists too and ambassadors for Christ as well. And so our heart back there is to equip the saints back there, those young ones, for the work of ministry. But there's people back there doing that. And it's for the work of the ministry, right? For, 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 for service. And he says, for edifying the body of Christ. To build each other up. That within this body, we would want it to be healthy. And so, the reason God has given these gifts, it's for the equipping of the saints it's for the work of the ministry. It's for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13 says, well, because you might go, how long do we have to do this? He says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. The goal is maturity. So as Mark said, I think it was Mark that said it right now, forever. <laughs> forever. How long do we do it? Forever. Just keep going. We just keep going. Um, there, there can be a temptation from those who stand up in places like this to say, well, I already taught that. Let me come up with something new now. What's that old story of a new preacher that comes to town? He gets a new assignment in a small town and he comes and, and he teaches and people go, wow, what a sermon, man, on that first week. What a sermon. This new pastor, man, he's going to be something good. The next week he taught the same thing. And they go, oh, it's kind of odd, but, you know, we'll bear with it. I mean, he's new, but it's still good. I mean, it's good to hear a second time, you know. And he teaches it a third week and a fourth week. And finally people are going, wait a second, does this guy only know how to do one thing? Like, what's the deal? And he says, I'll teach a new one when you guys do what the first one said, <laughs> right? It's just a joke, obviously, but, but what's the idea? Is that we're not here to come up with new stuff. Again, our, our desire is just to teach what the Bible says. Now, again, we have a systematic way of going through that. You know, the way we've kind of worked for a good while now as a church is, is we've, we've taught the New Testament on Sundays. We teach the Old Testament on Thursdays. Uh, we have a systematic little way, Pastor Gary, Pastor Jacob, and I, uh, of going through another part of the New Testament on Sunday mornings when Pastor Zeke's not here. But like, we just teach through the Bible. Why? Because we believe that that's where maturity comes. The, the Bible itself says, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We want God's Word going into people. And I think there's an encouragement, I, I'd say almost every time we're together, that this isn't just a once a week type of thing that you should do. Like just feed when you're here. The encouragement is to say, go home, take this stuff home and search it also. Read also for yourselves. Take the word of God in, eat of it. Learn the word of God. That's the appetite we'd like to create here. Again, with that old thing we talked about, what you catch them with, you got to keep them with. We don't have, you know, a dog and pony show here. We, we don't have a song and dance. We just teach the Bible because we really believe that as we teach the Bible, that's what we'll become, get an appetite for. Listen, there was a time I couldn't stand eating vegetables. 
Seldom when someone goes, pick anything, what do you want? I'm like, a place with good veggies. I don't, that's not usually how it goes. But I'm going to tell you, uh, once I turn 30, life changes, right? Like all of a sudden, your body starts devolving. And, um, and so my wife was like, you need to eat better. I'm like, uh, I'll just go for a couple extra jogs, you know. Uh, and then you realize by like uh, 31 that that's not possible, right? You can't outwork your horrible diet. And so what needed to start happening was I need to start eating healthier, right? As I ate it and ate it and continued to eat it, guess what I started doing? I'm going, not, I'm not going to say I love it, but, I, but there, there's a degree of like, okay, I can enjoy this a little bit now. You know what? It is okay. To where now there's even times that I'll go, I don't really like the veggies here. Or no, let's go to a place that's got some veggies because like I need, I need veggies. Like I need to eat, I need to eat right. You know? Why? That's what I have an appetite for. But if all I ate was still like chicken nuggets and mac and cheese or pizza and nachos like I did when I was a youth pastor, like it's it just, it, that's all you'll have the appetite for. And sadly, within the body of Christ, and I think it's criminal to be honest with you, I think it's criminal that so many churches in America don't want to teach the Word of God. That so many places go, yeah, yeah, we really don't want to say that part. We really don't want to go there. We don't want to say, why? The church needs to know. The people need to know what God says, even when it's uncomfortable. Right? I don't like being told how much of a sinner I am, but guess what? I need to know how much of a sinner I am right? I need to be encouraged in what I ought to be doing. And so he says, till we all come to that unity in the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God. Where do we get that knowledge of the Son of God? It's here in the scriptures. To a perfect man, he talks about maturity there, and and to the measure and stature and fullness of Christ, that we would always be growing into the head who is Christ. That the goal of the church, and, and man, I pray you've never thought that this is the goal of our church, is to, is to use the people in this church or, or whatever to run whatever program we're trying to run. I remember a pastor telling me really early on in ministry, he said, listen, Daniel, he says, the people that sit in, in those chairs, they're not a means to an end. They're not, they're not something that helps you to get where you want to go or to look good and, and, and feel cool or whatever. You're there to serve them. You're there to serve them the word of God. You're to tend to them. You're to help them and equip them so that they can be lifted up to Christ as what they are supposed to be. That's the goal. And that's the goal of all our teaching ministry here. And and here's the reason in verse 14. He says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. He says, we, we don't want you. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed this, like it, it's a little easier to deceive a child than it is like a grown-up. Um, I'd hate to give away his secrets, but I trust my kids won't watch this right now. My kids love their Uncle Tim. Uncle Tim has always done like magic for them where he'll like hide stuff and he'll like pull it from behind their ear or he'll pull it out of a pocket that they're like, what? Uncle Tim knows magic, you know? It's for fun but obviously it's slightly deceptive, right? This magic stuff. It's not really magic. <laughs> They're in the back right now. But, <laughs> but why is it so easy? Because they're kids, right? I think my son, who's 12 now, is starting to finally realize, like, wait a second. I, I don't think it's really happening, Dad. But I won't ruin it for the little ones. Good, good, good man. But, but why? Because they're children, it's easy to deceive a child. Why? Because they don't know yet. Not, not only do they not have the, the experience, they also just don't have the knowledge. Either one. They, they, they need both of those, right? And as, and as someone grows up, there comes a point that I'm like, it's in his hand, guys. Like, it's in Uncle Tim's hand. I see it right now. He put it in my pocket. I felt him put it in my pocket, right? When he, when he made you guys turn and go, look over there, he puts it in my pocket, you know? 
I mean, come on. You're not pulling the wool over my eyes. Not with that kind of magic, right? But why? Because I'm not a child. And that's what he says. He says that you'd no longer be children. In what sense? He says, toss to and fro. He says, by, with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. There's a couple ways this can go. Some people are deceived by just, just, just stuff. Not necessarily bad, bad things. But, but Now, some of the things are sinister and evil. And those, those drag. How do we keep from doing that? By doing this. By being equipped in the word of God so that we can't be tricked. But that's what's happened, right? That's what's happened. That over, over years of the church not being taught the word of God correctly, you get something that looks like America 2023. You go, how, how, does, how, are we, how, how did we get here? How is this going? It's like, because the truth isn't around anymore. So someone says it right? We, we have attention spans that are like this big now, right? And, and I think there was some sinister stuff behind that, right? Uh, just, just with the amount of media and all the type of stuff and the way it took it to where, to where even just, you know, you know, I'm not going to stay on a soapbox all day. I just, I just, I just, I, you know, I remember listening to a teacher who had taught English for like 30 years, and she had said when, when TVs were made accessible where families could have more than one TV and they started going into kids' bedrooms, she's like, that's when I saw a difference in writing. She was starting then, I started seeing a difference in writing. She goes, and now they have these little computers in their pockets, right? Easy, old man. I know, I know, I know, I know, I'm sorry. But the attention span is shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. So then what happens? Then people have a hard time thinking anymore. Then people, have, but here and here's the thing: I'm not just saying this isn't a like, hey, you know, delete your screen addiction stuff. It's not that. It's know the word of God, so that when things come across, we go, "That's not right." What's the old illustration, right, with the banker and the counterfeits? That that the banker isn't taught every different type of way to counterfeit a bill. What do they do? They just learn the real thing. Hey, get to learn the real thing so well. So well that you can know, and it's like, oh, that's not right. That doesn't feel real. Right? They don't study all the different types of counterfeits. Right? They just, they just learn the real thing really well. And that's the, that's the way it should be with us, that we would learn the Word of God, that we would know who God is. So when something comes through that we go, ah, uh, that doesn't, and, and sometimes we can't even say exactly what it is, but we go, mm, that doesn't sound right. There's different Bible teachers. There's different people, pastors. There's different, you know, they, a lot of them are on TV sometimes. <laughs> but they say stuff and you go, mm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not following that. I, I'm not, it doesn't work that way. And you look, just, you just dig a few steps deeper. I, I go, oh, they're selling a book. That's what it is. They're trying to get me to buy their book. There's a lot of money in that stuff. You know, what, whatever it might be, there's, there's trickery. There's things that people would like to lead people astray for their own gain. Or just because we have a very real enemy in the devil that would like to distract and disrupt and see people go to hell. That's part of it too. And so whether it's just like, like, like just a little, like they're just off a couple degrees. Well, it's good to know when we're off a couple degrees. Listen, I'm not here to say like that church, that church, that church, and that church, they're all bad. No, I don't. There's a lot of churches, very well-meaning, Right? Maybe, maybe the philosophy of ministry is slightly different from ours. Maybe things slightly different than, than ours. But, 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 but there, please don't think I'm saying, like, we're the only church doing this right. There's a lot of people, right? There's a lot of folks that are, that are teaching the word of God, that believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, that believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. You know, and, and so that we agree on. And the Bible's very clear. Who are you to judge another man's servant before his own master? He can stand or fall, and the Lord can make him stand. So we're not here to, to, to do that part. But we are here to say we need to know what the Word of God says. Because he says we don't want to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And it's easy. It's easy to just get, uh, you know, especially I feel like um, the church, you know, I've been paying probably closer attention uh, for the last 15 or so years. And I just, like I see it in cycles that like, the, uh, 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 an item kind of comes up, whether it's in popular culture, whether it's in politics or whatever, and all of a sudden the church just only talks about that thing, and now it's just this, 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 and, uh, to the neglect of the rest of Scripture. 
And, and I think, and this is just, again, this is our philosophy of ministry here. Our philosophy is that if we just teach the Bible well enough, if we teach it enough, and we give the, the folks here a hunger to be in the Bible, then you'll know what to do about those things that pop up in popular culture. You'll know what to deal with when, when the politics stuff happens. Or, or just to be able to say, I don't agree with that. And two, like our, our office doors are always open. You want to come talk about more stuff? If there's things that you're like, hey, like I, I, you know, come talk. We're, we're happy to talk. But when, the, what, but when the group is all assembled together, see the, see the beauty of this, and has this ever happened to you? I think it has. It has it happened to me. That you're sitting in and you're going, how does this guy know what I'm going through right now? How, how does, how, did somebody call him? Did somebody tell him? Because this is exactly what I was talking about this week. This is, this is what I needed an answer from God for. Or there's times that we were praying about something, needing something, and all of a sudden, the Word of God spoke. Here's the funniest thing, that the same Bible say, the same sermon, the same time together, five different people can walk out and go, man, the God spoke to me so specifically this way. And someone goes, really? He spoke to me so specifically this way. To- totally different things. Why? Because we trust the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is living and active. It's powerful. And God does His work by His Word. He didn't need my words to do that. It's His words that do it. So, He says that we shouldn't be tossed to and fro. We don't want to be uh, run about by the the trickery of men. He says, uh, but speaking the truth in love that we may grow up into all things into Him who is the head. That's the goal, maturity, that we would grow up into Him. And so, so that speaking the truth, that, that, that's kind of multiple ways here, not just the truth going out from this place, but that one to another, we would speak the truth to each other, right? And that we would grow. I love verse 16. It says, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. It causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. The goal is that the body would grow. See, what's so funny about the way the body works is some things are very visible, some parts of the body are very busy, but you need the whole body for it to do its job. Right, if, if I were wanting to do something today, you know, let's just say I wanted to stack the chairs in here, you know, and, and if I had to pick up all these chairs and stack it, my brain can say, okay, hey, we're gonna stack the chairs, right? And the arms could go, yeah, we're good with that. Yeah, we'll, we'll stack chairs today, no problem. And so we're like, hey, like, hey, are the legs on board? And the legs are like, yeah, dude, we're good. Let's go ahead and go do it. So we walk over to go get the hand truck to start bringing that in. And all of a sudden, the hands go, I'm not. I'm not part of it today. I'm sitting out today. I'm protesting today. And the arms are like, come on, you're right there. We're already on board. Like, you just have your part to do. And the hands are going, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't even want to be a hand anymore. I didn't even ask to be a hand. Right? <laughs> I'd rather be a foot. Well, that some, we already got two of those, you know, parts full, you know. All of a sudden, we can't even begin to start stacking chairs if the hands decide they're going to protest, right? Now, that's a real silly illustration, but, but maybe it's not so silly when we're talking about it in, in, in the way the body of Christ works together. Turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, one of my favorite passages on how it explains how, the, how these spiritual gifts work together. We won't read all of it. You could spend a couple studies in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. A few pages back, we've got a few minutes left. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see that there's different gifts There's different ministries, there's different activities, but it's the same Spirit, the same Lord, and the same God. That's uh, verse, I'm in 2 Corinthians, I'm like, why, it's not, it should be on the left-hand page, and it's not. (laughs) My goodness. Don't you love that about your Bible? That that it's like, there's times that you're like, you know, I don't know exactly where it is, but I, I know I know it's in Corinthians. I know it's on a left-hand page, right column, bottom. I know it's there. So when I look down, I go, it's not there. (laughs) But in verses four, five, and six, that's what he says, right? That there's different gifts, there's different ministries, there's different activities, but it's the same spirit, the same Lord, the same God. 
Uh, we see that in verse 7, that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, and it's done for the profit of all. Now, we see a list of gifts that are given here, um, and, and there's, there's, there's multiple gifts mentioned in this chapter. There's also some mentioned in Romans chapter 12. Like we said, uh, Ephesians isn't this exhaustive list of spiritual gifts. There's other ones, but even there's, there, there, there's more still. But, but he said, but here, you know, once he ca- talks about a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, the gift of faith, gift of healings, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Later in the chapter, helps and administration in Romans chapter 12, he talks about prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, leading, mercy. Those are some gifts of the Spirit. But we see that they're given to each for the profit of all. And in verse 11, it says that they're distributed to each one individually as he, as God wills it. Just like we talked about earlier, that they're given the way God would have them given. And he, and he talks about, as it says again in, in Ephesians there at the end, uh, that it's one body with many members. And we talked about how the body works with the many members. They all have to be on the same page. And it would be silly if they start fighting each other. We do have a a word for that, right? When the body starts to get things in it that are contrary to itself, right? And they fight against each other, cancer, right? That you have things that it's like, no, it's like, it's different from the rest of the body. And so it fights the rest of the body. That's not what we're aiming for. Right? We want a united body. And just like he's talking about, unity is what we're talking about here. Now, now, <laughs> the thing about the spiritual gifts, as we were talking about the protesting hand just a, a little bit ago, there's some that can become self-conscious within the giftings that God has given. In verse 15 and 16, he says, If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And, and if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Of course not. Uh, uh, Of course not. Just because the the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong. No, right? If we're moving chairs, we need our hands, but we need our feet too, right? Because I can't get to the next place if I haven't got a foot, right? So the foot has to do the foot's job. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, am I not of the body? Of course not. But don't we do that sometimes? We can be so self-conscious, and it's rooted in pride that we're like, well, I don't seem like Thomas, so I'm not part of it. Well, we already have a Thomas. We need a second Thomas. We already have one of them, right? Well, well, well. You know, like, and and again, I I think this is a problem with a lot of us that there's times in our lives that we want the gift that someone else has. Well, I wish I could do that like that person, and that like that person, and that like that person. Instead of just enjoying what God has given us to do. But we can't go the other way, and we can't be self-promoting. Like in verse 21, it says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Right? Just like I can't say, well, I'm the teacher today. I have no need of anyone else here today. That would be silly. Right? I can't tell the guys in the back, hey, I don't need you guys back there. They go, yeah, we'll see about that. (laughs) Who needs who now? You're going to teach from the back where you could, you know, do the levels? No. No. The body needs to work together. And then he says later in verse 26 that if one member suffers, they all suffer. And if one member is honored, the others rejoice with it. Just like our regular body would work. If one member suffers, they all suffer, right? My son's got a broken uh, arm right now. And, and man, other things are starting to get sore now. Why? Why? Because, because this can't do what it's always done, right? The elbow was, was, uh, was uh, what do you call it, where you can't move it? Whatever, they put the long cast on him. Well, then they immobile, and then they, took, they put the short cast on him. And the guy goes, you got to bend your elbow now. And he goes, oh, why? Because for two weeks, he didn't move his elbow. Regular exercise is needed within the body. And the same is true with us. Some of us maybe are that elbow, Right? We have No, no, I'm not trying to be rude here. That, that, that maybe we haven't been moving so much within our spiritual gifts. We haven't been doing what the Lord has given us to do in quite some time. And we start doing it and go, ah, I don't like that, man. Now I remember why I stopped serving the church because people are rude. It's just kind of the way it is. It's just kind of the way it is. Some people are difficult. It's okay. Some harder than others. It's fine. God has called us to still serve one another. Again, we can't have hands that protest and go, or, or for the hands to go, I don't, I don't need the feet. Yes, you do. And we all need one another. We need one another. As God has given us gifts, we need one another. 
And what a gift He's given us that He would give us the gifts that complement one another. How special. And then at the very end, he says, earnestly desire the best gift. And he goes, and then I'll tell you a more excellent way. The the best gift, what's the best gift? It's the one God's given you to exercise, but it has to be used as it says in chapter 13. And we're not not in Corinthians, but we'll tell you what it says in Corinthians, (laughs) that that excellent way is the way of love, that it's to be used in love. And isn't that what he's talking about back here in Ephesians? He says, for the edifying of itself, in love, that we would have love for one another, guys, that we would use the gifts that God's given. If you don't know what those gifts are, start praying and asking God what those gifts are. If you can't seem to find that, come in and talk with us. We'll help you. That's part of our job, right, here in the church. Come talk to Pastor Gary. Come talk to me. Come talk to Pastor Zeke when he gets back. Talk to Pastor Jacob. And and, and that's our job is to help you find those things. So, sorry, we went just a hair long. Uh, Let's have the guys come up and we'll pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are, for the gifts you've given. Lord, you're such a kind Father, such a giving Father. We thank you that to each one you've given. And Lord, maybe there's some in here that don't know what that is. We pray, Lord, that you would help them to see what that is. But Lord, we want to be, as we talked about for a pretty good while here, Lord, edified and built up so that we might be effective just as believers, Lord. We want to be your children. We want to follow you. We don't want to be tossed around by all these different things. So, Lord, help us to know the Bible. Help us to know your word. Help us to know you better. Lord, help us as a church that we would be about that, Lord, equipping the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand? Uh, If you should need prayer this morning, Pastor Gary's up here, Miss Lori's up here with him. Come get some prayer. God bless you guys.